Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Please come in and find your seat. For those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Andy Vaughn. I'm the uh, ASOR e Executive Director. It's been my privilege for, I think, 16 years now to welcome all of you to, to this event. Uh, this is an event that I started here saying that the staff and I really yearn and wait for this event. And as all, like all of you, we've been waiting two years now. And we're thrilled that, that you were here. I want to celebrate some of what is going to be able to take place in spite of the global pandemic. As of a few days ago, we have 79 uh, sessions, 367 presentations, about 500 people are going to be here, and it looks like uh, three quarters of you are here tonight, and that's really great to see. The virtual component combined with this will have 1,050 members from six continents. Last year we had 39 countries. I think we're even going to beat that this year. I want to call your attention to a few uh, bookkeeping matters and announcements. On the back of your name badge, there's some uh, safety uh, in information. In addition to the normal uh, safety information, we have um, COVID-related uh, re uh, in, uh, in information, and I hope that you'll uh, look at that, and I hope you don't have a need uh, for it. Um, I also want you to join me in taking advantage of your ASOR bucks. I went by the registration booth today, help desk, and save money on my membership for uh, next year. So over the next few days, I hope you will go by and do that. This is a year, we always thank the staff, this is a year that has really been hard on many people, and I want to thank uh, all of our staff. I want to give a special um, shout out and thanks to uh, Arlene Press. I'm blinded by the lights, so I can't see. Yeah. Ar Ar Arlene, I, I'm blinded by the lights, so I can't see you, but can you stand and what? She's at the very back, keep keeping track of everything. She's been receiving emails literally every 15 minutes, and I don't know how she keeps up with them, but she does. Other people that deserve special thanks are our program committee co-chairs, Helen Dixon and Allison uh, Th Thomason. When they agreed to do this job, they had no idea what was going to be involved this year. Session chairs also deserve a special thanks. Finally, I want to thank all of you. You have become annoyed with me and the staff by, sending, by us sending out emails saying, here's a Google form we, we want you to fill out. And we apologize for that, but it's really helpful as we've prepared for things. Um, it's so gratifying to see all of you here. It's been nice to um, see people and look, look, look forward to spending this uh, week, weekend uh, with you. So without further ado, I want to introduce ASOR President, uh, Professor Sharon Her Herbert, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Good evening and welcome to the opening plenary event of ASOR's 2021 annual meeting. It is so good to see you here in person. I'm just thrilled to bits. Yeah. Yay to you. As president of ASOR, it is my great honor to introduce Morag Kersel, who will be speaking to us tonight on Living with Legacies, ASOR Archaeo Activism and the Future for 21st Century Archaeology. When I'm working up introductions like this, I like to recall when I first came to know the speaker. 
and how they are connected with ASOR. Morag Kursal first came to my attention back in the aughts of this century, when as a graduate student, she was a candidate for a fellowship at an institute that will remain nameless. Uh, it was one of those committee meetings at a meeting like this, very like this, in a windowless room at the crack of dawn where a group of elders was deciding which lucky applicants would get the very few fellowships. As I recall, Morig's project was on the illicit antiquities trade in Israel and involved interviews with people and groups we activists, we academics don't often talk to. That application was my top pick and it was generally well reviewed but didn't win a prize at least the first time around. I was an outlier, although I fought like a champion. Some folks thought it might be too edgy, too proactive, too, I would say, interesting. Um, so it gives me a particular pleasure to introduce Morag tonight, a decade and a half later, as representing some of the best kind of work ASOR wants to showcase in 2021, vindication. Uh, I know a keeper when I see one. Anyhow, this is not about me, but about Morag and the exemplary body of work that she has produced and has made her the top pick of the program committee for tonight's plenary. Thank you, program committee. Morag Kersel is an archeologist who works in the Eastern Mediterranean in the Neolithic, Chalcolithic, and Early Bronze Age periods. She is particularly interested in how considerations of cultural heritage and the interpretation of the past among indigenous populations are understood vis-a-vis -vis archeological tourism, the looting of archeological sites, and the daily interaction between local populations and archeologists. She is a widely sought after speaker and an Archeological Institute of America national speaker, having held our own Norma Kershaw's uh, named lectureship uh, for a year. Morag prepared herself in a broad array of fields for, for her career, earning a 1988 Bachelor of Arts in Classical Studies from Queen's University in Canada, a 1994 Master of Arts in Near Eastern Studies from the University of Toronto, um, and a year 2000 Masters of Historic Preservation with distinction from the University of Georgia. After earning the Historic Preservation Masters, she administered the Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation at the Cultural Heritage Center of the US Department of State where she gained, as she put it, some real life experience in cultural heritage preservation. She returned to academe after that, and in 2006, earned a PhD in archeology span from Cambridge University with a dissertation entitled, License to Sell, The Legal Trade of Antiquities in Israel. She now teaches in the anthropology department at DePaul University, where she directs the museum studies minor. She is, also affiliated, she is also affiliated faculty at the Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law at DePaul College of Law and a research associate at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. She is the co-author of the 2013 book, U.S. Cultural Diplomacy and Archaeology, Soft Power, Hard Heritage, and co-editor of Archaeologies of Text, Archaeology, Technology, and Ethics. Her articles are legion. Most recently, in 2021, in the Journal of Field Archaeology, she authored together with several collaborators, Why is there still an illicit trade in cultural objects? And what can we do about it? Other titles include Fractured Oversight, the ABCs of Cultural Heritage, in Palestine after the Oslo Accords in the Journal of Social Archaeology. Another, Hope in Dirt. I always had that, Hope in Dirt, report of the Fort Apache Workshop on Forensic Sedimentology Applications to Cultural Property Crime. This in the International Journal of Cultural Property. This is a woman who gets around. Wait, there's more. 
She is also currently involved with a number of archaeological field projects. She is co-director of the regional exploration into the Galilean ancient landscape, a new initiative investigating social and ritual organization in the Calcolithic of the Levant. She also co-directs the Follow the Pots projects, project, one of my favorites, an interdisciplinary investigation of the landscape of the dead at the Dead Sea Plain, Jordan. We are lucky to have Maura Kersel with us tonight. How has she found time? She will tell us now. I give you Maura Kersel. Um, Sharon, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thanks to Andy. Um, welcome to our first live meeting since San Diego. Um, so this is how it started and this is it, but really I wanted, this is really how it started, but I thought only Kate Grossman would get this joke, so um, I spent many uh, days playing this game with my brother and sister, forcing them to play it, and that's where I am today. Okay. So I come to you today as a settler colonialist, living and working in the traditional homelands of the Miami, the Kickapoo, the Peoria, and the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. This city remains a contested land in the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi per the 1833 Treaty of Chicago. I recognize the enduring presence of the First Nations on this land. To support First Nations sovereignty and self-determination and education, please consider donating to the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at the University of Alberta to support some of their important work investigating residential schools. I'm privileged to work in Israel, Jordan, and Palestine, and I'm grateful for my collaborators and community partners in those places. I've tried to credit all of the images I'm using today in this presentation, and hopefully there are no copyright violations. I want to provide a warning about the images of our ancient ancestors, because we have great reverence for the people from the past, and we never show human remains without much careful consideration. All of the ethnographic interviews were conducted with protocol review from the various ethical review boards. I'm here today with a lot of angels on my shoulders, I can hear them whispering and shouting in my ear. They're the legacies I cherish. A thing I've missed most about the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, is my weekly drop-in at Patty Gersenbluth's Loop office. We're both at DePaul and Patty has an office down here in the Loop while mine is up in Lincoln Park. In a few hours, we would solve the many cultural heritage quandaries that face the world. I'm indebted to her wise counsel. She's the very embodiment of everyday activism. Who watch out when we take over the world. I offer my thanks to, ASOR, to the ASOR president, Sharon Herbert, and to the ASOR program committee for the opportunity to share some of my insights on living with legacies. I see this invitation as an act of everyday activism taking a chance on an archaeological outlier like myself. This may not be the plenary some in the audience want, but I believe it's the plenary we need in the time of Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, and the climate crisis. I'm delighted to be speaking under the new moniker of the American Society of Overseas Research. Oriental, traditionally referring to anything east of Europe, has harmful connotations associated with colonialism, imperialism, and emphasizing an east versus west binary, reinforcing destructive racial, racial stereotypes and exoticizing the other, and maintaining a status quo of western dominance. Oriental was a legacy with which we lived until it was excised from our name signaling ASOR's commitment to overcoming legacies of colonialism and unequal power dynamics from which this organization and the discipline of archaeological inquiry in the Middle East, or in the Eastern Mediterranean, emanate. 
We can all agree that removing Oriental doesn't mean that there's no more colonialism. It means that we believe there is an ASOR after we examine and rid ourselves of our more problematic legacies. Changing a word is only the beginning of this ongoing process of what must be done. So as Sharon said, I teach in the anthropology department at DePaul University, which is the largest Catholic undergraduate university in the US. Who knew? I didn't until I went for my job interview. Of the 20,000 plus students, 60% come from Illinois and almost 50% are students of color. A third of the student are first generation, as am I, and her, he or first generation is defined as the first in their family to attend university. 40% are transfer students, many coming from the city colleges of Chicago. The combination of these amazing students and a city filled with museums and cultural heritage resources makes for an excellent environment in which to teach, to teach and to learn. Recognizing that they lived in a society marred by systemic inequality, Vincentian founders Vincent de Paul and Louise de Marillac, committed to inner city mission, asked and strived to answer what must be done. Following in their footsteps, I acknowledge, as St. Vincent did, having charity in our hearts and words isn't everything. It has to be put into action. Living with legacies and injustice takes an unrelenting commitment to doing better, leaving a legacy of good. In the face of climate change, conflict, development, economic insecurity, uh, iconoclasm, looting, pandemic, and systemic, systemic inequality, we have to go do good. And what I'm considering, a sequel to the very first keynote presentation I ever did on doing good, and inspired and encouraged by a lot of really smart people in this room and outside, I want to offer some concrete action items that we as individuals as a, and as an institution can do to address the question of what must be done. We, the members of ASOR, live with legacies. 19th and 20th century fascination with the people and places related to the Bible resulted in a more formalized archeology span and cultural heritage laws and an enduring Western interest in the region. For decades, scholars have carried out the important work of tracing the effects of Western imperialism on archaeology, demonstrating how colonialism determined which questions were and were not investigated, depicting how some archaeological evidence has been systematically misinterpreted to offer justification for colonial interests. We need to know and acknowledge these legacies. I will not be presenting on the historical origin stories of our work in the Eastern Mediterranean or in biblical archaeology. I leave that to my learned friends and colleagues like Jeff Blakely, Will Carruthers, Eric Klein, Elizabeth Cooper, Elena Dodge Corbett, Chloe Emmett, Jack Green, Shimon Gibson, Umur Harmanshah, Lynn Maskell, Michael Press, Neil Silberman, and so many others. Luckily for all of us, on January 22nd, 2022, we can all attend the webinar, The Not-So-Innocents Abroad, The Beginnings of American Biblical Archaeology, with scholar Rachel Hallett. Suffice it to say that we live with legacies, both good and bad. We also live with the persistent and prevailing stereotypes of archaeologists as swashbuckling adventurer, reified through film and in video games. Again, due to a lot of really smart people like Barb Voss, Kevin McHugh, um, Tina Rasla, sorry, Tina, uh, and her colleagues in the pages of Near Eastern Archaeology, the notion of archaeology as adventure and archaeology, archaeologists as culturally insensitive, treasure seeking, and risk taking, is being interrogated and upended in an attempt to dispel prevailing myths. Here again, we have archaeologists doing good through everyday activism. In their 2021 Sapiens op-ed, Allison Mickel and Kyle Olson argued eloquently for archaeologists as, as activists. Quote, as disciplines, anthropology and archaeology are entirely about people and about making sure that everyone's stories are understood and heard, particularly those of the most marginalized groups, end quote. 
While many of you may bristle at the word activism, and I suspect you might be the same people who at every ASOR meeting lament the journal name change from biblical archaeologist to Near Eastern archaeology, the activism of Mickle and Olson and myself includes the small acts of everydayness, which do good. Our activism is also the good and necessary trouble of the late Congressman John Lewis. I know today that Kevin McGue is on the picket line this week, Activism in Action. Recent publications by Allison Mickle on archaeological knowledge and labor and Fiona Greenland on art police and tomb robbing give voice to typically silenced aspects of archaeology. The interdisciplinarity of these studies bring greater depth and dimension to archaeological inquiry in the 21st century. By allowing the subaltern to speak, these often overlooked and relegated topics result in everyday activism. The ASOR annual meeting program is another excellent example of activism and doing good, with increasing sessions devoted to time periods and topics once on the margins. This year, in addition to the legacy sessions, you can hear about archaeology of Islam, the contemporary, community archaeology, cultural heritage management, digital scholarship, enslaved, nomads, careers outside the academy, and museums and social justice. And if you thought that the museum justice would be the focus of this plenary, I encourage you to attend the virtual plenary in December and the session tomorrow at 420 in Continental A. I'm coming for you, Partage. It's happening. This is all a far cry from what I witnessed in the early 2000s as I waited outside a session, for, outside a room for a session to end so I could set up for the session on archaeological ethics and responsibility that I had co-organized co with Ellen Hersher and Patty Gersenberg. Two other people were also waiting outside the room and I overheard this conversation. Person one, are we in the right place? Person two, let me check the program. No, next in this room is archaeological ethics. Person one, Ethics. I don't do ethics. Let's get out of here. Person two, we'd better figure out where we need to be or we'll be stuck with ethics. <laughs> I was amazed to think that there were archaeologists who out, out there who believed they don't do ethics. It's unlikely I would hear this today. This is not your grandparents or even your parents' ASOR. This year's program, both in person and virtually, signals an ASOR for the future everyday activism. Recently, in my class on anthropology and museums, one of the students asked whether DePaul should offer a class on ethics in museums. I responded that a goal I have as an educator is rather than having standalone courses which individuals can opt in or out of, we should embed ethics in our everyday teaching, no matter what we teach. We all wish we didn't have to be ethicists or activists, but we do. Do you really think that Beth Mackay wants to quantify and highlight that er until very recently there were more papers on pigs than there were on women in the ASOR program? Activists are necessary, and I say this because Beth isn't here this year, but I know she would appreciate this. Activists are necessary for communities and the discipline to thrive and survive. Someone recently told me that I needed to go back to my ivory tower and stop critiquing museum spaces. Nah, as a museum going member of the public and a member of the academy, I reserve the right to voice my opinion. We all need to get out of our ivory towers and make good trouble. That's what must be done, everyday activism. Who could have predicted the prescience of the 2019 poster by Lucas Stevens and Virginia Herman mitigating the climate impact of the ASOR annual meeting, a first appraisal? First, it was a poster. And you all know I love a good poster. And the poster session is on Saturday at 1245, just outside. Posters are becoming recognized as equal to, if not surpassing, paper presentations in efficacy and outreach. Proof positive, my badge, that says I'm a poster presenter and not the plenary. Secondly, who knew that only months later some of the findings and recommendations made by Stevens and Herman would become the norm in the time of COVID-19? 
During the poster session, I saw the brilliance of their request that we consider how ASOR and each one of us was contributing to climate change. I also saw that their suggestion of a hybrid meeting was a way of democratizing the meetings with additional intentions of recognizing climate change and our duty of care as stewards of the environment. My takeaway was our academic arrogance in having the meeting typically in a US city and expecting colleagues from the regions in which we worked to participate. Hybrid meetings are a great equalizer, allowing colleagues to avoid the dehumanizing post 9-11 US visa process, ameliorating the cost of travel, and at the same time lessening some of the unequal labor of child and elder care which disproportionately rests with women, a fact that Beth, Margaret Cohen, Jenny Ebling, and others have been telling us for years. After estimating the total carbon emissions of travel to the ASOR meetings, Stevens and Herman proposed several pragmatic strategies to mitigate emissions, telling us what must be done to do good for the environment and for the future of ASOR. We should applaud ASOR for their commitment to addressing climate change with a hybrid meeting model and, encouraging, and encourage them to make this a permanent feature. That's what must be done. <laughs> Recently, at the invitation of Glenn Corbett, Andy Vaughn and I were panelists at Bible Fest, where we discussed hot topics in archaeology in this region. Glenn asked us about the major threats facing archaeological sites, objects, and their local communities. We all agreed that climate change was among the most pressing. It's impossible for anyone in the global north to ignore the climate crisis, which according to Del Palm Guedes and her colleagues, is a direct result of the extractivist nature of colonialism and capitalism. In the forthcoming volume, Ethics and Archaeological Practice, edited by Sarah Kite Costello and Sarah Lipinski, Benjamin Porter addresses the future of Middle Eastern archaeology vis-a-vis -vis the climate crisis. In this paper, Porter makes an excellent case for examining climate change as it impacts not only our practice as archaeologists at the site level, but its direct bearing on the quality of life for the people of the region. Porter highlights a series of action items relating to what must be done for climate action and archaeology of the 21st century. Echoing Stevens and Herman, Porter suggests an examination of the impact of our carbon footprint as we fly across the world to fieldwork sites. We all need to consider our carbon footprints and fieldwork. In 2020, and let me just tell you how happy it makes me to show this slide, because I love white Christmas. Uh, thank you. <laughs> in 2020, as I contemplated the first summer in 18 years of no overseas field work, I was reminded of the immortal words of early Irving Berlin in White Christmas. What can you do with a general when he stops being a general? In the aftermath of World War II, the general is looking for purpose and employment. With the help of Rosemary Clooney, Bing Crosby, Vera Ellen, and Danny Kaye, General Waverly reinvents himself as a ski resort manager in Vermont. As a result of the pandemic, scores of archaeologists across the globe faced summers without field work. What were we to do? In 2011, John Cherry lamented the prevailing sentiment of excavation as the signature ge gesture of our discipline. Are we defined by fieldwork? And if yes, how do we accommodate an empty summer? What could we do instead of fieldwork? Do we need to reinvent ourselves? It took a nor'easter for William Carraher to slow down and pay attention to the environment which eventually led to his conceptualization of slow archaeology. And Bill, I expect you to correct me if I've mischaracterized any of your work. I suspect COVID-19 had a similar effect for many of us. Without summers of field work or study seasons, as a discipline, we were forced to slow down and reevaluate. The slow archaeology of Carraher asks us to consider archaeology as a process inseparable from the knowledge it produces. 
While this may seem self-evident, what's groundbreaking is the focus on smaller, slower projects, which according to Carraher, provide a more immediate and embodied connection between fieldwork and archaeological knowledge. Perhaps Carraher's slow archaeology also includes the small things and periods forgotten of Dietz. Slow archaeology prompts us to reflect critically on the impact of technology, on the production of archaeological knowledge, the structure of fieldwork, and ultimately the nature of the discipline. COVID-19 asked us to rethink traditional models of archaeology. We may have more time to sift through our backlog of notes, files, maps, plans in order to make headway into publishing our results. Is COVID-19 our moment to address what Barb Voss identified as a crisis of confidence for archaeology? The impulse to keep excavating set against widespread failures to publish in a timely manner? One need only turn to the Shelby White and Leon Levy program for archaeological publications for examples of how to utilize research generation, uh, generated by earlier excavations. The excavation reports supported by, White -Levy, by the White Levy program provide an excellent example of how to clear the buildup of unpublished archaeological fieldwork from sites in the Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, Iran, and Mesopotamia. This is what must be done. COVID-19 is also our moment to contemplate. We all know that not everyone has equal access to vaccines, to education, to employment, to health care, to child and elder care. Everyone is affected differently, and our archaeology of the future will need to reflect the disparities brought to the surface by a global pandemic. Unlike General Waverly, we may not need to reinvent ourselves, but we may need to do archaeology in another way perhaps more slowly, more publicly, more innovatively, eschewing the traditional modes of dissemination, moving beyond legacies, the legacies with which we live. This is what must be done, although we cannot do this alone. When I assign group projects in class, I tell my students when they complain, and they all complain, that life is one big group project. Archaeological fieldwork is the very embodiment of a group project. No one does anything alone in the field, and while I doubt there's anyone in the room who would argue with this, our current modes of assessment do not reflect the, interdisciplinarity nat or the interdisciplinary nature of archaeology. In a recent Twitter thread, ancient historian, archaeologist, and Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the University of Southern California, Mark Litteni, highlighted the inconsistencies in our discipline. If we as a field are going to keep pushing the value of collaboration, we absolutely have to figure out how to value it. Until we dispense with the idea of the single-minded genius sitting in his, yes, his, office, cracking the secrets of the universe, we'll fail, A, to value good and perhaps even better work, and B, to actually assess work more in line with what we espouse. I believe that this is one of the most difficult legacies that we need to overcome, the ideal of the single-authored academic paper published in a premier journal. Right? Not only must we reward group work, we have to acknowledge more non-traditional forms of scholarship. On leave for the academic year 2021, which sounds good and theory, but let me just say, when you're expecting to access archives and travel, it was not ideal. Instead of producing the book I pitched in my leave application, I turned to follow the pots. Pulling together the various data we'd been collecting since 2011, I reconfigured the website. It remains a work in progress as the Arabic translation is currently missing, but there now exists a robust account of the 1978 Baba Dra tomb group dispersal that ASOR was a part of. The amount of work that goes into websites, podcasts, blogs, blogs is never adequately credited in academic merit reviews, job applications, or promotion and tenure evaluations. And yet these are often the most public face of archaeology. For years at the annual meeting, Sarah Witcher Kanza, Eric Kanza, Chuck Jones, and many others have dragged us kicking and screaming into the 21st century of digital publishing. 
Some of us have embraced the pioneering efforts of the Alexandria Archive Institute and Open Context, the web-based publishing platform developed for archaeology and its related fields, but more of us need to. These digital repositories provide greater access for all, resulting in a more just archaeology. This year's workshop, 2 p.m. Friday in Waldorf, focuses on publishing digital content. Attending, that's what must be done. What else must be done? We could follow the lead of the Archaeological Institute of America and their 2018 guidelines for evaluation of digital technology and scholarship in archaeology, which I believe Aaron Averett had a hand in crafting. This is the future of academic assessment. If you're in administration, the dean's office, on your TBP committee, on the ASORS publications committee, you need to use your power to make change in how we value and assess academic contributions. This is what must be done. Iraqi archaeologist Jafar Jathari recently tweeted, international archaeological teams treat sites as oil fields taking knowledge out but not sharing the results with Iraqi colleagues. We have to acknowledge and address the extractive nature of archaeology. Foreigners fly in, they excavate, they dig things up, they leave the site with the objects, the maps, documentation and data, perhaps even gaining permission to take things home for study. We publish typically in English or we don't publish at all and rarely do we share the results of our final publication with the communities in which we work leading to the question I am often asked through the course of my ethnographic work. How are archaeologists any better than looters? Both come to a site, they dig, they take away the finds, we never benefit, end quote. Increased recognition of our legacies has resulted in a more self-aware archaeology characterized in part by greater collaboration with local partners, producing a less extractive and more inclusive archaeology. But there is more work to be done. In their bold and necessary paper, Resistance and Care in the Time of COVID, Archaeology in 2020, Delpom Gadez, Gonzalez, and Rivera Gozalo set out a series of recommendations for the future of archaeology in the 21st century. They suggest that, quote, breaking down colonial and imperialist hierarchies must move beyond empty words. Researchers should engage in active collaborations such as co-authorship, research design and interpretation, facilities investments, specialist training or scholarship, all in avoidance of instrumentalist or exploitative approaches." End quote. This is the community archaeology of Sidney Pickens and Alexander Jones, public facing by and for the community. We can learn a lot by looking to archaeologists who work in other parts of the world. I realize that this is not always feasible or even possible. Sometimes communities don't want to collaborate or engage, and I'm often reminded of the warnings set forth by Laura Jane Smith and Emma Waterton about being overly optimistic and unrealistic about incorporating every voice. Sometimes community don't want, communities don't want to participate, which I know some in the room can speak to. But it's something to which we should aspire greater inclusivity in our archaeological practice. During a June 2020 webinar, Archaeology in the Time of Black Lives Matter, sponsored by the Society for Black Archaeologists, panelists advocated for accomplices over allies. I'm committed to this call for accomplices. This moment needs more people to act, to speak up, support colleagues, and make changes. As Beth Nakai recently emailed me, no one wants to derail their career by taking the time to do the right thing, the thing that must be done, but at this time, that right thing seems more pressing and important than focusing on what will get us promotions and pay raises. I acknowledge my privilege as a tenured white woman of a certain age that it's on me to take on the responsibilities of challenging the archaeological museum and cultural heritage canons addressing injustice and changing the narratives in the classes I teach, in the archaeological and ethnographic field work I carry out, and in the communities where I live. But I can't do this alone, and I rely heavily on my students, friends, colleagues, and other accomplices for insights, wisdom, and advice. I rely on them to tell me when I make mistakes, which I often do, 
when I do harm, when I need to do better, and when I need to step back. I also rely on them to let me know when and if I've made a difference. And to be honest, I'd be nowhere without the Twitter sphere. That's where I learn, engage, and understand better how to be an accomplice and how to go do good. It's an ongoing process, and in our big group project, that is ASOR, I hope that we share strategies, discuss successes, and admit failures, and that we all leave the plenary with some action items to implement in our archeological teaching, research, and community engagement lives. But a word of warning, there is no magic checklist where you can tick boxes off and think, there, I'm an activist. It's a forever practice, and if you're serious about being a good accomplice, you will always be reviewing, tweaking, changing, reading, challenging, tweeting, learning, even when it's difficult and uncomfortable. It's going to be a lot of work, but we are all in this together. I want to end with some archaeology. Imagine that, archaeology at the ASOR Plenary, oh, as a case study of everyday activism. In an attempt to stop the illegal flow of archaeological objects from Jordan, on January 31st, 2019, the U.S. Department of State published a notification in the Federal Register of the receipt of a request from the government of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the government of the U.S. Recognizing that their cultural heritage was under threat, Jordan requested import restrictions on archaeological material representing cultures from the Paleolithic through 1750 CE, and that's their cutoff date for their law. Any country who is a state party to the 1970 UNESCO Convention who can demonstrate that their cultural landscapes and objects are at risk because of demand for ethnographic and archaeological material in the U.S. can request a bilateral agreement under the 1983 Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act. I'm only briefly mentioning this. If you have further questions, you should contact Patty Gerson Blith, who's my go-to consultant for all things legal. The requesting country puts together a dossier of supporting documentation, which then an 11-member presidentially appointed committee reviews. Included in the dossier are letters in support of the request for the bilateral agreement. With a single letter, we can speak for the sites, the artifacts, and the local communities to encourage institutional country-to-country -country partnerships to protect the cultural heritage in the countries where we work. Over 30 American archaeologists and anthropologists who work in Jordan wrote letters in support of the Jordanian request, including first-hand knowledge of looting experienced at their sites, what the Department of Antiquities was doing to protect sites and to facilitate the exchange of ideas. In his letter, prehistorian Gary Rolfson offered observations from the field. Even in the remote regions, such as the Black Desert of Eastern Jordan, some two hours across the desert from the nearest town, looting occurs, despite the best efforts of the Department of Antiquities. The committee also considers oral comments from experts and individuals who can provide data and insights supporting the country request. And that's where we, the organization, and the members of ASOR come in, writing letters and providing oral testimony that speak directly to heritage at risk, the efforts of the country, the archaeological permitting process, museum loans, and educational exchanges. Everyday activism. So for also almost 20 years, I've been tracking the movement of archaeological objects from the ground to the consumer, the paths they take, the hands they pass through, the borders they cross, who buys them, all that stuff. This research is part of the Follow the Pots and the Landscapes of the Dead research projects, which I co-direct with Meredith Chesson of the University of Notre Dame and Austin Chad Hill from the University of Pennsylvania. And we do this in collaboration with our partners at the Department of Antiquities in Jordan, Mohammed Azahran, Jihad Darwish, and Jamila Ishtwe. Along the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan, there are a series of early Bronze Age sites, and we are defining the early Bronze Age from about 3600 to 2000 BCE, thought to be by some the cities of the plain that are mentioned in Genesis in the Bible. Formal excavations at places like Baba Dra have indicated that these can be both mortuary and domestic occupation at the site, or just mortuary as in the case of Fatham. Many of the sites are at risk due to demand-driven looting, which is, which is the result of, in part, tenuous associations with the Bible. 
And that's a story for the, another plenary if you would like to invite me back. In support of the request from Jordan, we at the Follow the Pots provided data from drones. Since 2013, using unpiloted aerial vehicles or drones, we've been monitoring change over time at FAFA. In addition to carrying out pedestrian and ethnographic survey, data from drones provides us with the potential to watch change over time and to assess the effectiveness of Jordanian Department of Antiquities projection strategies. Um, they posted guards, the local community is monitoring the sites, and the impact of our own interactions with the landscape. We, okay, it's really just Chad, put together the digital elevation models, which we compare from year to year to identify discernible modifications to the landscape in the form of new holes as, other, as well as other negative interactions. Over the course of four field seasons, we documented 61 new holes at the site. From the systematic excavations carried out by Tom Schaub and Walt Rast and also Mohammed Najjar, we know that each grave has between 6 and 30 pots. From my market research, we know that each pot might sell on average for between $30 and $150 in the U.S. market. Thus, 61 new holes have the potential to realize a total financial gain from the end market sales in the range of around $11,000 to $275,000. Not a huge amount in the antiquities trade, but enough to encourage the sustained pillage and destruction of the sites. These maps and statistics generated from the drone data provided compelling evidence for the historic and ongoing looting at, these, at the early Bronze Age site of FAFA. In addition to data from drones, the ethnographica interviews I conducted between 2007 and 2018 indicate that U.S. demand for archaeological objects in the legal market in Israel results in looting in Jordan. For more information, come to the poster session, because that's my poster, um, where I will be talking about something from the time of Jesus, why people are buying these artifacts. This information was all provided to the Government of Jordan and to the Cultural Property Advisory Committee in both written and oral testimony. After reviewing the dossier, interviewing experts during the public session, meeting with representatives from the Jordanian government, the Cultural Property Advisory Committee deliberated the evidence presented. And in December of 2019, the U.S. and Jordan signed an agreement acknowledging that the cultural heritage of Jordan was at risk. With a single letter, we members of ASOR can speak for the sites, the artifacts, and the local communities to encourage institutional country-to-country -country partnerships to protect the cultural heritage in the countries in which we work. Everyday activism. But activism we have to do every five years because Patty wanted me to remind you that none of these are, these are all renewable and we have to keep doing this activism. Our legacies are important. For good and bad, they're the reason we are all here. As Yuriki Kruschek in her important piece on big digs and the future of classical archaeology notes, there's room for optimism as we turn to slow archaeology, small th things forgotten, and topics and places on the margins. We are filling the gaps, and I would suggest doing what must be done for the future of archaeology in the 21st century. I am indebted to the many ASOR mighty girls who inspire and encourage me every day, and so many others, particularly in the Twitter, Twitter world. The montage is far from complete, and I know there are people out there I've left off who are doing what must be done, but I see you. Let's be honest, who runs the world? Girls, right? Yes, exactly, we do. I'm also grateful to the ASOR Iconi crew who during the pandemic kept up the meeting tradition cocktails with some pretty spectacular quizzes and games and exchange of Amaro recipes. People of ASOR, every day I see the future of overcoming legacies and doing good. I see it in your collaborative field work, in your publications, in your everyday activism, in your op-eds, in your social media posts, in your TV appearances, in your service to the organization, and in your teaching. Just as I see the legacy that people left us, that was good. 
I know that the future of archaeology is very bright. Activism can be exhausting, and the flies in the Eastern Badia are relentless. I want to thank the many women who have stepped up and spoken out, to quote Keisha Supernat, to take the lead at ASOR in writing the harassment policy, the code of conduct, to head up the DEI and climate change, an initiative for the status of women task force and committees. Right? Thank you. Despite appearances to the contrary, ethics and activism are not solely women's work. And I also want to acknowledge the various males who have also stepped up and spoken out. I also see you. I'm in awe of the excellence of the archaeologists, ancient historians, museum professionals, teachers, and textual scholars of the future. Just as I am in awe of the generations who left us amazing legacies. It's my hope that I have been a mentor to some and helped others and stepped back when necessary. Speaking truth to power, however uncomfortable, is where real transformation is possible. We have to be brave, we have to take chances, and we have to speak up on behalf of the people and places of the Eastern Mediterranean. We live with legacies, that's a fact, but it's what we do every day that will make a difference for the future of 21st century archaeology. Our activism has to answer the call for good and necessary trouble of John Lewis. What must be done? Everyday activism. Thank you. Um, uh, Arlene wanted me to tell you that there are mics, there are four mics around the room, and if you would have a question or a comment or whatever, then feel free to speak up. Or maybe there's nothing to be said, there's only things to be done. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> but we've done so much. But we do have stuff to do. I did say to Arlene there might not be any questions. Not really a question, kind of. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you so much, Mark. That was fantastic. Um, so I know you did a lot of really interesting work during the pandemic on local monuments, so maybe I can bring you back to Chicago. Yes. Um, I'm curious how you have found things to be different before and after the pandemic, and in the classroom, for example, the types of questions you're getting from students, um, the topics they're interested in, whether local or, you know, internationally as well. So I'd, how that's changed your, uh, your teaching approach. Thank you so much for that question. It's fabulous. So I'm a teaching institution. If you didn't know, DePaul is, um, we're not an R1. We're really about teaching. Um, and they could care less that I do any of this stuff. They really just want me to be teaching. Um, so uh, it has been quite different to teach this fall in person, face to face. Uh, but I will say that uh, true to the slow archaeology of Bill Carher, I really, when we were faced with a, the summer of 2020 in Chicago, not going into the field, but at the same time, um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, was on the rise and there, were a lot of, um, there was a lot of unrest in the city. Um, both York and I took to riding our bikes and so we have been all over the city on bikes. And I will say that I had never really explored Chicago because every summer when Chicago's at its finest, I would be somewhere in Israel, Palestine, or Jordan. And so I have appreciated, I have a newfound love and appreciation for this city. And I have a newfound appreciation for the monuments because in July of 2020, overnight, the statue of Columbus, which is not far from the Field Museum, was removed by the mayor's office. And it was removed because there was a thinking uh, in the moment of protest that it would be taken down. So it was proactively removed. And at the same time, the mayor established a panel of people who would examine 
monuments throughout the city. The panel identified 40 problematic man monuments, or po monuments that needed further investigation. And I use now the Chicago Monuments Project in my teaching, and actually on Monday with my colleague Rebecca Graff of Lake Forest College, we will present at chat a walking tour of some of the monuments that are proposed to be um, removed. And we have put together a story map, and if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share the uh, website for that, because it's a pretty interesting set of monuments. Four of them are Lincoln. Um, one is the Balbo Monument, which is the monument that's near and dear to my heart, which is a um, first century column from a temple in Ostia that was sent in 1933 by Mussolini to celebrate Balbo's transatlantic flight uh, during the Century of Progress, the World's Fair. And so that is also one of the monuments under consideration. So I drag every single class I teach to the Balbo Monument. <laughs> and they create a label because at the moment there is no label for the monument. So you don't actually really even know what you're looking at. So I would say that this is definitely the city and the time to be teaching post-pandemic, well, I don't even wanna say post-pandemic, um, in a moment where we're in the classroom because this city basically, these classes teach themselves because I just uh, wander around the city with the students as you saw. Any other questions? Okay, so you all have a charge. What are you gonna do? What must be done? What are you gonna do? So I expect you to come and tell me over the course of the next three days what you're gonna do to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morag, for that inspirational talk. There is an enormous amount of work for all of us to do on many fronts. Uh, there are many, many ways to be an activist, and Morag exemplifies one and shows us many roads, and I'm sure, I hope you take her up on her challenge of um, coming to her and telling her what you're going to do, even, I'm sorry, <laughs> even if it's something very different. Um, so this concludes our 2021 plenary. Um, as most of you know, I'm the Grinch. We're not having an opening, recep an open reception, an opening reception. I just thought there was too much of a super spreader event to it. And until we have masks with straws, uh, I don't think we can return to these uh, mosh events. But I hope you all go out and celebrate and this first real live meeting in two years. And on, I think you all know from the registration process, on Saturday night there will be a reception for limited people, but you can sign up at the Oriental Institute. So thank you all for coming, both to this talk and to these meetings. It's wonderful to see you again, and go out there and enjoy, and enjoy over the next five days.